In the Living Bible translation of John 4, 35, it says these words. You say, and we do, there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. We have all these preconditions. We got to do this. We got to do that. I met one man that told me, until we know the name of the local devil, we can't cast him out. And that's why we need to spiritually map the area, find out what the demon's name is, call him by name. And I said, Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ to them. He didn't know the name of the demon that ruled the place, but he knew the name that would make him leave. I'm going to say it again. My thoughts are not your thoughts. They're nothing like each other. One day, God is working on Peter. Watch this. God is working on the man at the gate beautiful. They're both being dealt with for a dramatic nitroglycerin convergence, an explosion. An explosion is coming to America. It's going to hit the campuses. It's going to be records of people being healed in hospitals. We're going to hear people that in one moment, I was going to kill myself and blow my brains out when Christ appeared in my room and I've been born again. You're going to hear testimony. I'm some of the top, uh, I'm one of the highest paid movie stars in Hollywood. And I was doing cocaine and I had all the women I wanted when one day the power of God struck me and I couldn't get up off the floor until I repented of my sin and turned to God. You're going to read about it. You're going to hear about it. We're not ready for it. And this is why churches that want a calm, predictable program are not going to make any sense in the next few months. Only the churches that are ready for the unexpected. A biker is coming to church. A devil worshiper is coming to church. A politician is coming to church. We can't have regular church. And then the lukewarm Christian will get all offended. Oh, I like my church before we started doing all this. Bye, because 10 more are going to replace you as soon as you walk out. 10 more prostitutes, addicts, atheists, devil worshippers from Colorado. They're coming. Get ready. They're coming in Jesus' name. You're yelling, Mario, you're yelling. The devil just said, save your voice. I'm gonna test you on that right now. Bartimaeus is blind. He's, somebody said Jesus is over there, he's walking. He's gonna be within range of you in the next few minutes. And he starts yelling. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And someone said, quiet down. And it says, so he yelled louder. <laughs> How many of you are like that? Oh, I don't believe. Would you please quiet down? I said, would you please quiet down? You're getting too loud. We're going to offend people. The police are going to come. So, You pass with flying colors. <laughs> Peter isn't praying for the sick. And he knows that man's supposed to be healed. Why? The last words almost that he heard from Christ were in the 16th chapter of Mark. You'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And he isn't doing it. Because he remembers one thing Jesus said to him. He said, the day's going to come when you will be, someone else will wrap your outer garment around you and take you where you would not go. And the Bible says, by this he predicted what death he would glorify God. Peter knew he would be a martyr. And so he did the math. As long as Jesus taught, everything was fine. But when they began to be verified by miracles, he became a threat. And Peter knew that. But you see, when you're a man of God 
and you're supposed to operate in miracles and you don't, something starts eating you up inside. So every day, he's giving that man a lot of money because he's renting days of powerless ministry. This is the rent. I'm paying the rent. I'm paying the rent. But inside, he's getting sick. Volcanoes starting to erupt. You see, I know some of the most famous preachers in America. I don't know how. I don't know why they dare to even talk to me. But they do. And they'll tell me. I know that I have 10,000 members. But I go out of church, the most depressed and frustrated person you ever saw. Because I know this is not what God wants. I'm not preaching the sermons I want. I'm preaching the sermons that somebody told me will make the people happy. But one day, God in his infinite mercy was dealing with that man in the cup, with the cup, and dealing with the man of God who was renting days of powerless ministry. And he made him leave his money on the dresser. And we have it totally wrong. We have silver and gold, have I none? It went down like this. You know I'm good for it. I, you know, I'm, I'm good. It's here somewhere. Hang on. And then he said, I don't have any money. And then it hit him. I'm not supposed to have any money. You don't need me to give you money. That's not what you need. I'm waiting for the day for the American church to wake up and say, you do not need all of the stupid things we've been saying to you to keep you from being offended, to keep you, because what we've done is we've gotten your superficial loyalty to us, but you have been deprived of the miracle that God wanted you to have. Now, how many of you believe that it's more important tonight at 6.30 for the people that come to get miracles than for me to preach a popular message? How many of you believe that miracles are more important than popularity? How many of you believe that signs and wonders are more important than the favor of people? Clap your hands in Jesus' name. Well, and I would, I would have loved to have been there when Peter reached critical mass. I don't have any money. I'm tired of having money. I'm tired that this has all been about money. You're not supposed to sit there and beg. You are a, you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You've been set free in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk and throw that cup away because you will never beg again as long as you live.